Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, you know, we in the spring we talked about the um, the 20th anniversary of completing the Human Genome Project, and as a follow-up to that, researchers have recently released a new uh, pan genome reference, which is a high-quality collection of human sequences. Uh, with a more sort of diversity of people. R the original reference was one person, and they've been working on building a, a, a bigger uh, library of more diversity. And we now have up to 47 people, but the hope is to get to about 350 people. And eventually, uh, you know, the, the All of Us project is eventually to get to a million people. But the reason that's important is there's so much diversity, there's so much in our genomes that is identical, I mean, over 95, 98, 99%, but the 1% differences are really the things that are so important. Uh, and we need a much broader analysis of that data. So we're very lucky uh, this week in the setting uh, of all this new information uh, to welcome Dr. Amy McGuire, the director of the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy, and Dr. Richard Gibbs, the director of Human Genome Sequencing Center, to talk about some of the big issues that uh, confront us both uh, ethically as well as scientifically uh, about this new information that we should get and what the future uh, of genomic studies is. So we're really excited. Come join me as we uh, go discuss with them uh, uh, in the Human Genome Sequencing Center. Well, happy Friday. We're here on location in the Human Genome Center, and we're going to get to talk to two of the people who really make all the sequencing and all this stuff happen. Uh, Richard Gibbs, who's the director of the Human Genome Sequencing Center, and I got it right, right? That's right. Yeah, and, and Amy McGuire, who is the director of <laughs> Center for <laughs> Center for <laughs> Medical <laughs> Ethics and Health Policy. Uh, so anyway, thank you all for taking the time today. Uh, we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project. And in, as I was thinking about that, I wanted to ask you, Richard, because you were such an important part of that. I mean, that was like a Manhattan Project. So, so there must have been things that happened along the way that were really weird and surprising. So can you think of anything that happened that in those 20 years? <laughs> Well, yeah, it was 13 years from the beginning to when we finished it, and so there were a few things and a few stories to be told. But of course, the big one was that the private uh, industry stepped up kind of late in the game and said, why don't we carry the ball over the finish line, and you guys could go do the maths. And then, uh, we'll, by the way, we will uh, sell the data to everybody now instead of giving it away. So that's probably kind of the biggest uh, bump in the road. I remember that. So, and Amy, from your perspective, I mean, Everyone talked about the uh, ethical dilemmas that would happen, but what are sort of the major uh, things that you've had to think about in terms of having the privacy issue and, and, and once everybody's sequence was known? Yeah, I mean, I think privacy and data security was kind of the biggest issue. Um, as soon as we got the reference genome sequenced and we started to do individual human genome sequences, we had massive amounts of data from individuals that could potentially identify them and, and reveal very sensitive and private information about people and their health. So privacy issues for sure and how we were going to protect privacy while also making the data widely available for research use was... was and that, that's got to still be an issue, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's it doesn't go away. It's an insolvable problem because yeah. you can always identify an individual through, from their sequence. I mean, yeah. anyway, so that's done. What What is the next big horizon for the Genome Project? Well, we want to make this data more, frankly, more useful. I mean, there's some sort of good news and bad news since the Genome Project was done. The worst news is that genetics has turned out to be a lot harder and a lot more difficult route to letting us understand the molecular basis of human disease. So it, stuff, frankly, is not as useful yet in the clinic as we want it to be, so that's our big challenge right now. And Amy, when you think about sort of what's, what, what kind of data sets we have now, what do you think in the future is the kinds of things we need to add to the Genome Project? Yeah, I think the biggest issue now is that most of the Genome Project and the subsequent early sequencing was done on individuals of European descent. And so diversifying the data sets and making sure that it's really genomics for all is, is kind of the key thing for the future. One of the interesting things to me is a better understanding of sort of human evolution. And, and what kind of uh, sequencing projects need to be done, you think, to capture more of what's 
how our species evolved. Well, this is where there's some of the good news. So, as Amy said, the first part of the project was focused on mainly on one individual and wasn't a measurement of the full diversity of everybody. But since then, we've done several projects that measure diversity across the planet. And we're building, most recently, building this set of genomes that are very high quality references from multiple individuals around the planet. So we're now getting a good handle on this full spectrum of human diversity. Yeah, and, and last, or a few weeks ago, I, I discussed the, uh, the One Health concept uh, and, you know, how as we encroach on animal species, we are more, more uh, subject to getting viruses and other diseases from them. What role should we be playing in, in sequencing like, for example, the bat project, you know, the bat 1K project, or other animal species? Well, I, you know, I think the mantra is that if you digitize the information, then you can do amazing things with it research-wise, uh, in terms of tracking epidemiology, and in terms of designing uh, responses to a treatment. So, you know, we don't understand the diversity of bats. Good example. Let's, let's measure that. You know, no bat left behind can be a, <laughs> a mantra. So, and, and Amy, one of the things as a, as a physician, I, it always, you know, bothers me that this data isn't, you know, readily available or, as you said, understandable for physicians. What do you think are the major barriers before we can have that, like, in the medical record and be able to use it? And, and, and what are the scary things, you know, implications for patients and doctors if you have that information? Yeah, I mean, I think that we need to kind of update our regulatory system a little bit and provide... Um, greater protections against misuse of the information. Um, we have some protections on the front end of, you know, restricting access of who can get access to certain information, particularly if it's in the medical record, it's, it's protected by HIPAA and other, um, other federal laws. But we don't have a lot of accountability on the back end for people who go in and are bad actors. And, you know, they go in and they, they hack the information and they use it in really dangerous uh, ways. So we need more protections on that side. And one other thing about the, that I've often wrestled with is what do you do with patients who may have some genetic predisposition to something bad? Should we, do they want to know? Should we know? What do you do with that? Yeah, there's been a lot of concern about that and how are people going to respond to that information? Is it going to cause a lot of psychological distress? And most of the research that's been done so far shows that people are pretty adaptable to the information that they receive, even if it's really bad information. Um, not everybody wants to know that information, so we certainly need to make room for individual choice and preferences, but uh, the vast majority of people who do want to know it and receive the information tend to, tend to you know, really adapt to it um, in a healthy I, way. It totally freaked me out. I think I wouldn't want to know, but I just yeah. personally, it's yeah. like, I'm going to be dead at 32, no thanks. I'd, well, I mean, it's also important to understand Makes 31, that. Your, your 31th birthday <laughs> really bad. <laughs> It's also important, though, to understand that most genetic information isn't that sort of deterministic, right? So, you know. You can hope. So, you know, so one of the things that I think that's, for me, uh, it's most interesting is that, well, you know, the sort of Mendelian trait inherited stuff, with, which is in children, you know, it was very promising. You think, well, that's going to, we're going to figure out all these complicated disease in, in adults. And it hasn't happened. So, you know, how, how, how do you, you know, figure out the complexity of a multi-genetic disease? I mean... Oh, we're going to get there. We are. Yeah, it's a hard problem, but it's not like understanding chaos. You know, it's tractable. But we do need the regulatory updates. We need to be able to access all that clinical information so that we can put that together with the genomic information and really get the understanding. So it's a tough one, but it's definitely not intractable. Yeah, I actually think that the, we're way behind on the clinical information piece the putting the phenotypes with the genotypes that really get good understanding. We we've lost that as physicians. We we don't do as much phenotyping as we used to back when we didn't have the electronic medical record. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Also, you you're you're not kind of um, incentivized to look at things that aren't there in front of you that people say are important. So you can't pick up the ancillary information. So what about the rest of the stuff? I mean, the, ge the genome is great, but obviously, you know, there's a lot in between that and the, re the physiologic response of a cell. So are there other steps that need to be, you know, done now or down the road? I think we are entering into this area of functional biology that's actually linked to the genomics. So in the past, we'd kind of do the genomics and hope that we'd find an association with something we already knew in the phenotype. But now, 
there's more and more emphasis on taking the genomic information and using that to drive the biological experiment. So that's the way to figure things out, and I think we're making big steps there. So I want to I want to end with one thing because I gave my sister uh, a subscription to Ancestry.com, you know, and 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 then you hear about all these stories, you know, that you, where you have linked, you know, criminal activity based on these databases. What 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 are you going to do with that? I mean, what are people going to do? Do they are they going to stay away from that, or or you think? How do you how do you manage that kind of data set when people want to know their genealogies? Yeah, I mean the genealogy information is super interesting because a lot of people are discovering deeply, deeply held family secrets, sometimes for generations, right? So that you know, there's a half sibling they didn't know about, or uncle's not uncle, dad's not dad, you know, those, those sorts of findings. And so. Um, you know, interesting. There's a lot. We hear lots and lots of stories about that, um, and I think it's inevitable. And people need to know going in that that's a possibility, even if they don't think there's any way in my family that that's a possibility. It's still a possibility, right? Your family, exactly. But um, but you know, we've done some research on it, and we did a, a survey actually with over 20,000 people who participated in those types of services, and the vast majority of them despite the findings, um, had really positive experiences overall, net positive experiences. There was a small minority who had really bad experiences, but, um, and we need to pay attention to them as well. Well, thank you guys for taking the time. Uh, this is one of the coolest things we have going here at Baylor College of Medicine, and uh, love the, the fact you spend the time to tell everybody about what's going on, so thank you very much. Thank you, okay. All right, thanks so much to uh, Amy and Richard for that wonderful discussion. Uh, it's great to have expertise like that around. And I want to finish today with a shout out. Uh, this summer is always an exciting, it's an exciting time at Baylor College of Medicine. We welcome new students and residents and graduate students, orthotics and prosthetic students. Uh, in this, this, this time, for the first time, we are welcoming our new medical students on our regional campus in Temple. So these are, these are uh, uh, our first episode, our first time to, to have a regional campus. We're really excited about these students. And we, we really are excited about the future of our institution and, and the future for them. So welcome everyone and off to a great start uh, after this July. Have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you.